Okay, hello, good afternoon. I think there is a lot of the football discussion around. <laughs> Color football uh, sport discussion around. Uh, good afternoon to Alberto, Alberto Diaspro. Thank you very much for being here together with us. It's uh, one of these um, uh, afternoons and one of these weeks that the person that we have on that table, he's not an architect or he's not an engineer, or he's not related, let's say, directly with the construction scale of the traditional architecture, but he is related a lot with um, uh, the vision of the new architecture that we are trying to experiment here that um, includes a lot of disciplines, disciplines of biology, disciplines of applied physics and nanophysics, um, nanomaterials. Alberto is uh, an expert on that. He's actually the deputy director and um, the director of the nanophysics department at the IIT, the Institute of uh, the Italian Institute of Technology in Genova. Uh, he's, uh, I, 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 was, I visited that institute, I don't know, like a few months back, together with Manuel and Nicola, and uh, the research that they are developing there is actually amazing, from the very small nanoscale material to humanoids and robots and to all this kind of uh, uh, bio, nano, physics, technology, robotic, there are so many things. Uh, so Alberto is directing many of that things, I think, and I hope today he will show a variety of, uh, of that work. And I would like to thank you very much and I would like to invite you to join us to a new way of thinking where architecture is working in different scales and in different disciplines. So please help me to welcome him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation and it's really exciting being in a place that is unusual for me, uh, this architectural uh, fab in some way. Um, and so let's try to comment with you this crazy title, uh, does the aesthetic sense also exist at the nanoscale? Now, just a few words about my institution, that is the Italian Institute of Technology, this building here. Uh, we are very lucky because in the very same building we have uh, real multidisciplinarity. So we have uh, robotics, we have uh, a neuroscience, we have the way for transforming energy from sun or other sources to electric energy when you need it, and we have smart materials and many other options for discussion uh, in this place. The kind of studies we have in this institute move from the nano up to the human scale. And so what we think is that uh, could, could be exciting, useful to try to learn, for example, from nature. And probably this is what you do, and we try to do. But we try to do this at this very small scale that is the nanoscale. So imagine that we are moving from antibodies, viruses, then we move to dogs, horses, human, and in parallel we try to develop new things, new technologies. Uh, we try to find something new, so you could call them discoveries, uh, designing intelligent particles, having them in clusters, mounting them in micro robots, mounting micro robots in miniature robots and then growing using advanced mechatronics and moving to humanoid technologies. In all this scale we try to learn and we try to have uh, cross interactions with scientists from different disciplines. And just to give you an idea, just uh, I told you a few slides about IIT, these are the disciplines of the 1,441 people working at the IIT. And let you know that the average age is uh, uh, 33 years. Sorry. We have people from uh, 51 nationalities. And uh, we have 47% uh, of women and 53% of men. So I think that this is a good number in terms of gender. And all these guys share the very same coffee machines. 
And coffee machines are the right place for having new ideas. I will show you something later. However, when you were mentioning something about uh, changing uh, the way we can think about architecture, houses, or science, I think that this guy, I don't know if you know this guy, uh, this guy, the name of this guy is uh, Richard Feynman, was Nobel Prize in Physics 1960. And this guy is, is also famous for this sentence that today you think is by Apple, but is by Feynman, that is think different. And we will see what does it mean. I wanted to start with this guy because this guy posed a problem related to a possible aesthetic sense at the nanoscale. Let me bring to your attention this very old sculpture related to beauty and to a flower to bring you to this, uh, I'm sorry for the Italian here, I will tell you something, I will tell you what's, what's going on here. Uh, in this uh, reading by Feynman, is reported a discussion with, about, with an artist. And the discussion with the artist is related to the following topic. The artist is asking Feynman, is telling Feynman, you scientist, when you start studying something, you make this uh, no beautiful, no uh, harmonic, but something that you split in different components and after this, you can say something about the mechanism of working of this object and so on. And Feynman is replying that, uh, for example, knowing something at a scale that is smaller than the centimeter or the millimeter could be nice. For example, which is the molecular mechanism for a flower having a certain color for attracting insects. There is some, uh, something related with sex with attraction, with aesthetic sense there at the nanoscale. And so the answer of Feynman uh, with this guy is that uh, I don't think that we are reducing the beauty of nature or what we have around when we try to study this at the nanoscale. But I think that we are able to increase the sense of uh, wonder that you can have when you try to understand how nature works and how matter has a relationship in terms of atoms and molecules. And these, for example, are nanoparticles, new generation nanoparticles. And I think that you can find something that is not only technical with them, so the way they aggregate one with the other. This is a nanoscale. These are more or less five nanometers. But there is also something that can be related with beauty. This is what I think. And we started having uh, some uh, relationships since we, make, we try to make new materials with some artists. I don't know if you know uh, Maria Rebecca Ballestra. She's an artist from Genoa. And we decided to have some exhibition reporting about our discoveries and the way of communicating this kind of discoveries through this kind of view or change in perspective, as Maria Rebecca was telling us. Now, you are young, so probably you never saw this movie, The Graduate, or maybe some of you. In this movie, there is a sentence. There, is a, there are very only few minutes when, uh, to the main actor, that is Dustin Hoffman, Another actor is showing something and telling something like this. Please have a look of this and remember its name. This will change your way of living and the way of living of everybody in the next years. I don't know if you know what is the object and which is the material because probably because you're young. This was 1960. 1960 was the word was plastics. Uh, in Italy, in Genoa, we had the Nobel Prize in Liguria, we had this Nobel Prize by Natta with the invention and discovery 
of a material that you probably know as Moplen. Not sure that you know this name, but you know about plastics. Today, we have this new material, few atoms of carbon, in a very thin layer. You can have this material in a very nice, in a very simple way. Simply take your pencil, start scratching your pencil over the paper, and when you have graphite, take some adhesive, put the adhesive on the paper and on the graphite, and start peeling in a gentle way. Peel it, peel it, peel it. When you don't see anything more, you have graphene over there. Graphene is a monoatomic layer of carbon atoms and has really wonderful and unbelievable properties. Let me tell you just a very a story, a very short story. Imagine that you have to go to the la premiere of an opera play. Uh, this is mainly for women. You are ready, quite ready to go. You are late, a little bit late. And you discover that uh, you do not have the appropriate bag related with your clothes, with your dressing. You, have no, you are late, so you have no time for changing your dress. In case your bag is made by graphene, you can imagine, and what you can do is taking a picture of your dress, sending this picture wireless to the bag, and having the bag changing shape, color, and style according to your dress. It's something that is not, apparently is not very useful for the community probably, but just to tell you that with graphene you can imagine and you can design something without thinking is it possible or not. Everything we think will be possible using graphene. And if you are worried about costs of graphene, forget about it. Start the designing and then think about costs. Today in Genoa we are able to make uh, layers of graphene one square meter and we plan to have a factory for making graphene close to the area of the AIT in the next three years. So this kind of problem will be overcome. What is relevant is that you start having new ideas for using graphene. Any idea you can have in mind. Now let me be back uh, to this uh, scale and let me to show you, to introduce you, iCub, that is our humanoid robot. It's not a mechanical robot. Uh, it's a humanoid robot. So it's supposed to think and to learn from the environment. What does it mean? It means that uh, it's the very same principle you can adapt to a house that you want to build or to a building that you want to design thinking about uh, changes around, so you need uh, something for giving ICAB the feeling of what's going on from the environment, skin, eyes, voice, ears, uh, any other possibility. And so I like to, to show you ICAB because probably you know that in robotics the main step, I mean w when robotics started changing was when uh, people were starting making nice and very well functioning ends. Because this is the end that you use to do everything at the end of the day. And with your anthropomorphic uh, way of living and things that you have around, but are ends. And uh, in 18th century, robots were also used in the evening because they didn't have TV, and so they wanted to have someone making something strange or in an automatic way. But today we have the cognitive robot. Cognitive robot means that you can really download an app for this iCub, having this iCub working in a specialized environment, for example. But just to, to give you 
a link with architecture, if you want, or with something that, uh, in terms of building, can change according with the need of humans, maybe you read about this first robot, 200 after Christ, made by Erone. Erone had a very deep knowledge in physics and realized that when you make, when you have vapor, you can have forces. And when you are able to produce forces, you cannot wait something. And so he was using this kind of robot for having the doors of a temple opening when needed. This is a very primitive understand example of building changing its shape automatically and on demand in some way using an actuator, not using human, but serving humans. Today, well, yesterday, ICAB was like a child, so was moving in this way. Today, ICAB can walk. Uh, now, I will stop here with ICAB, but just to tell you that in the IAT, we have uh, a reference for our studies as the reference you can have if you think that you want to design new buildings or new things. And our reference is ICAB. We try to develop new technologies in order to have ICAB better and better every day. And so we can deal with water and fire. So we can have materials that in case of fire, they don't suffer. So you can shine there this beam or this fire and they don't, they don't change shape and don't change temperature on the surface too much. Or you can have materials that when water is impinging the surface, uh, don't uh, uh, keep water, but um, repulse water. Like in this case, this is what we call the smart sponge. This is a normal sponge you can have at home. There is a treatment made by nanoparticles. And what is blue here is oil. What is transparent is water. So it's a mix of water and oil. In this case, you can simply use this new material for attracting oil and having water out. So this what happens if you have water here and oil here? And then, if you want, you can recycle oil when you have your oil contaminated by water. Or in case you have a disaster in the seawater, you can think that you can collect the oil and you can leave there water. Nanoparticles. On the surface of that sponge, there are nanoparticles. So objects having a scale that is one billion of meter, or if you prefer, 10,000 times smaller than your hair. Uh, this is more or less the shape or the design of a nanoparticle. So you have a core, then you have something around. For some reason, for some utilization, you might have these nanoparticles. And in this case, you have something that is able to recognize a target where you want to send the nanoparticle. The active core is inside. Overall dimension here is 5 nanometers, or 10. Now, you can use this kind of nanoparticles that I find nice. Uh, not only for the sponge, but also for humans. These are large nanoparticles in the electron microscope. And you can use them for humans because you can inject nanoparticles. Uh, let me be back to slides. Nanoparticle. Uh, Trojan horse means fat, lipids. Lipids help nanoparticles to enter in the body because the your immune system will not recognize the nanoparticle. Otherwise, you start recognizing and uh, trying to, to destroy the nanoparticles. And the blue ones are 
small particles, small molecules, that are able to recognize, in this case, cancer cells. Okay? So you inject them, they are able to recognize a tumor, because tumor cells on the surface have some receptors, and the recognition of the receptor is on the nanoparticle, so they link the tumor, and when they are there, you can use magnetic resonance for finding where the tumor is and where the extension is. You can use them for delivering some drugs, having a slow release in time, or you can use them for inducing hyperthermia and so some therapy there. Why not using this kind of nanoparticles for building houses? for designing new buildings. Because the concept is the same. You inject something in a specialized way. This something is sensitive to the environment and is sensitive to some actions that you can make whenever you want. So increasing temperature, releasing something, or making visible, or changing colors to a wall. Uh, in this case, these nanoparticles delivered in the body are also magnetic, and so you can use a magnet for collecting them. Why? Because when you inject in the human body, you can drive them to the region you are more interested in. These kind of nanoparticles are part of the dream reported by Feynman of having uh, there was a discussion with a guy that was called, his name was Alan Hibbs. Alan Hibbs was telling Feynman, ah, it would be nice to have a doctor that you can ingest in your body. It's terrible, having a doctor inside, small. Uh, well, this, and then there was this movie, uh, The Voyage, um, Terrific Voyage, Viaggio Allucinante is the Italian title. Uh, Asimov, uh, was not the story by Asimov, but Asimov also had a book about this. And this is an object that can be injected in your body and can deliver whatever you want and control it like a drone from outside. Or for people from Genoa, you can go to buy focaccia and where you buy focaccia, you can also have yeast cells. Yeast cells are spherical, and there is a lot of genetic knowledge on yeast cells, so you can design any kind of yeast cell. You can insert into, you can insert these yeast cells in the Trojan ores made by lipids and uh, a target recognizer, and you can deliver these cells in a living body, in this case the paramecium is not a human body, you can deliver there, and when they recognize what's going on in the environment, for example you have some pain from your muscles, uh, they can produce something for reducing the pain, because they recognize what's going on. Why this? Uh, is there any beauty there? I think yes, it's due to the interaction, it's due to the way they do. But why this? Because we are moving in our society within these three families of new technologies related to humans and wealth. Genomics, done. Now you can buy for $90 a kit that allows you to screen all the disease that you might have. So when you buy it and you use it, please don't read the output, otherwise you get crazy. You can have probably everything. But there is a probability related with each disease, so if you're able to read it, do that, and you can recognize which kind of disease is going on, this genomics. Then there is proteomics. So people is using what's going on in the part related to the relationship of our molecules with our body. But what is nice is that for 2022, the expectation is having personalized medicine. What does it mean? It means that you can inject some DNA, you can have your DNA or RNA, and these will be able to recognize at early stage some of your possible disease, 
and to correct before you start having the disease, the disease itself, then you can survive no more than 120 years in any case. Now, this is the limit. Even if yesterday, I don't know if you have seen the time cover was 142. I'm not ready for understanding 142, but 120 is the number that people uh, defined years ago. Personalized medicine. Personalized medicine and learning from nature, again, in this case from plants. So what we are doing is not only developing a robot and some stuff for the robot, but trying to learn from neuronal cells, I will show you later with these objects, and from plants. We are building, we are designing, Barbara Mazzolai is doing this, a new robot called Plantoid Robot. Uh, this is Barbara Mazzolai. Plantoid Robot is a robot that is learning how to approach movement and the way it connects with other objects, learning from roots of the plants. So like uh, in this movie, we are trying to understand which are the forces related with the growth of roots at this millimeter level and then down to the nanoscale. And so again, you can have different conditions. So the environment could be light changes, or could be something related with icing, or can be something that we inject in humans for having an endoscope navigating in your body and finding new situation in your body. I don't know if you can think or design a new building growing, having roots, and using roots for finding for you, people in the building, what you need, and bringing this to you, for example. I don't know. But it would be nice uh, following some research in this sense. Let me be back to cells and to what I like to define beauty of the cells. But cells uh, that are very complicated, mm, cells like these ones, the blue is DNA, and then is the building, and the red is more or less the energy factory in the cell. Cells, uh, at the end, are electric machines. So you can control them by electrical input, and you can receive back electrical output. So in case you are able to produce an array of electrical sensor, you can learn something about what they do. And uh, the problem we have when we want to learn something about some specialized cells like neurons, the problem is related to numbers. So you have in your brain, more or less, this number of neurons as this number of connections. Would, be, would you be able to design a building or something uh, having this kind of objects and having this kind, this number of potential communication in order to function well? I mean, what about when you go to the fridge and you take a hack and you don't break it? Amazing. How many neurons? How many synapses? How many calculations are working for you that time? And so Michela Chiappalone is trying to measure the electrical activities of cells on a layer, on an electrical layer, and making this very funny and nice experiment that is this kind of robot. These are cells. And so this robot is made in the following way. There are wheels, there is a camera, and there are real cells from your brain on the top of an electric circuit in the robot. So this is the robot. This is the 
measuring of the electrical signal from the real cells. Now what's going on is the following. The robot is moving. One re and can receive more or less two main signals. One is related to a white reflection. This means that an obstacle is close to the robot. And the other one is a stop signal related to the fact that the robot hits the obstacle. Okay? Every time there are these two signals, the electrical circuit is sending a punishing uh, electrical signal to the real cells. After 20 times, the robot eats the obstacles. The cells, when they receive a signal related to the presence of an obstacle, immediately produce molecules that change the voltage at the electrical layer, and so the robots do, does not eat the obstacle. And this can be useful for understanding how our brain works, but you can understand immediately the number before was 10 power 11. And now we are working with the 10 power 2 of cells. But it's the beginning for understanding, and it's complicated enough. Now, coffee machine. At the coffee machine, there was a nice meeting for a coffee between Fabio and Guglielmo. Guglielmo is an expert in transforming solar energy in electrical energy. Fabio is a neuroscientist. Fabio had the following problem. When you become, you become blind, you are not able to transform the light input in an electrical signal. And then you have the chain that starts with your vision. Guglielmo is very skilled in transforming light in electrical signal. Mm. So they decided to try to use this plastic device made by Guglielmo with on the top neuronal cells and to understand if first cells could survive, second if they could get input from the solar um, light. And they published this paper, Nature Communication, immediately. Nice. Then they decided to move to a mice. A mice made blind genetically. So this mice was blind since the very beginning. This is very relevant for the experiment, I'm sorry. It's relevant because in case was not blind since the beginning, you can think that you restarted the memory he had when he was not blind, or he or she was not blind. And so they decided, so this is a corrupted retina, this is a normal retina, they inserted the plastic by Guglielmo here, and after one year, the mice started getting the light stimulus for the first time. And now, the next part, it, it's very difficult to work on, on the mice, because the eye of the mice is smaller than the one of the human. So in this case, you see more or less, this is the layer, and this is the implant. And next step will be pig. That is the next in the evolution. And then you have pig, and then you have primates, and then you can have humans. So I think that this kind of experiments is better, that is done in the appropriate way. Now, this is more or less the things we are interested to study and to develop. But now we need to have a closer look at the nanoscale to what's going on from, let's say, the hand, hair, mammalian cells, bacteria, mitochondria, virus, small molecules. Your eye is able to get the details at this scale, 0.1 millimeter, more or less. If you use a carved glass, so a microscope, you can get 100 nanometer, that is not the nanoscale. Today, we are able to get information here from 1 to 10 nanometer, not using an electron microscope, but using an optical microscope. 
It's different. I don't know if you know something about the electron microscope. The electron microscope allows you to see atoms. Unfortunately, if you want to study what's going on in your body, I have to ask you to be solid, to be to become solid. I have to cut you physically. I have to send some um, uh, metals on your on the top of the slices, and then I have to use electrons. If you agree, we can go on. If you do not agree, we have to find a different way, and the different way is optics, because optics use visible light from red to blue. Sorry for the other people, and just let me let you know that uh, hopefully also in architecture you agree with physics. Uh, white and black are not colors. So just let you know that because sometimes uh, there is a team in Italy they say magic colors that uh, I don't know what's going on but come on the only colors they have are red and blue at the end of the day <laughs> sorry about that okay but now with the optical microscope you can go there and so you can split uh, the hair in more than four probably in 10,000 um, slices and you can get a better inside, and you can have a real comparison between two hierarchies that maybe you're interested in. And they have a, there is a lot of beauty here. I will be back on DNA later, if you have time. And so you have DNA, then you have cells, then cells go in tissues, then in organs, in systems, in animals. And then you have this hierarchy. So you design monomers, you make polymer. With polymer, you make structures, you make nano devices, you make structural components, and then you have vehicle or buildings, whatever you want. You can study matter using this old record player that is an atomic force microscope. I don't want to tell you anything about the atomic force microscope, but just telling you that this is a microscope allowing you to study surfaces at the atom level. Or you can use this old-fashioned instrument that is the microscope. Why am I bringing to your attention the microscope? Well, because I'm Italian. And the term microscope was coined in Italy. This guy, uh, Faber, wrote to Federico Cesi, that was the president of Accademia Lincei, a letter about this instrument by Galileo Galilei called Occhialino, and wrote him, Microscopium nominare libuit. Starting from this date, April 13, 1625, the name of the microscope was Microscope. Then, uh, I don't know if you recognize this place, uh, this is Cortona, and this is the monastery where San Francesco lived. It is not due to the Alzheimer that I'm showing you this picture. Uh, we were there because my daughter is a fan of Giovanotti, and Giovanotti lives in Cortona. So this was a terrible story. But it helps for my story now. So this is the monastery. Uh, this is the tail view of the monastery. And this is a book. This book, called Micrographia, was written by Uck, that is not uh, related with Peter Pan, who was a scientist. And Uck was a physicist, very curious, and was explored at the microscope, and was decided to explore nature. Like you, probably, in case you had a microscope, having a lot of bad things uh, going on, and putting them under the lens, and for every object, he had a picture and he had a figure legend. He had no computer. So he was simply writing, having a view, and drawing. When he was in front of this picture, he really didn't know which kind of figure legend writing. Then he reminded that he had a friend that lived in a monastery and that that building structure was very regular and was made by cells. And so he proposed the name of cell. And today you and biologists and medical doctors use the term cells coming from an observation of a microscope related to an architecture. 
So this is the reason why I'm bringing to your attention this fact about the microscope. And then if you want to study what's going on in the architecture of the biological cell, this is the cytoskeleton, and these are proteins or molecules moving there. It's really so complicated what's going on. So trying the way for studying what's going on here when you have a cancer and when you're able to remove cancer from your body is not so easy. And you can think that this machinery is really a nanomachine. I don't know if you have an idea of what does it mean nanotechnology is related to what? To your ability of controlling or observing what's going on, what is around you, at the nanoscale, at least in one dimension. Doesn't matter third dim three dimension, one dimension. And here you have DNA. This scale is two nanometer. These two nanometer are controlling this machinery that is 20 nanometer, that is the one printing the information into the cell. And having the cell that is more that, that is 30,000 nanometer acting in a certain way and then aggregating, aggregating and becoming organ or whatever you want in a normal way or not. So when you have a muscle, when you're moving your muscle, there is something at the molecular level that is playing in this way, molecule by molecule. And when you have pain, this means that there is a, a connection with your neuronal system bringing some molecule to produce pain for you. Or when you are not able to take something, there is some rupture here. But these are single molecules. And we can learn from them because machinery that we have is exceptionally efficient. Or when you have a cholesterol, this means that you have these drafts. And these are lipid layers of your cells. And these are cholesterol bubbles that are working and are moving with your, with your cells in your body. Or these are other objects in your cells. I think that also at this level, you can find something that can provide an aesthetic sense and a sense of harmony when it's functioning well and when it's not functioning well. Now, one of the best examples, I'm close to the end, uh, a, a nice example of this machinery comes from DNA. All of you know about DNA, about human genome and so on. And you probably know that these two guys, Watson and Crick, Watson and Crick, uh, were able to define a structure that you also use because it's uh, really a beautiful and harmonic structure. And also it's a very efficient structure when you want to do something in buildings or in cells. These two guys, these were the instruments they were using, not very sophisticated. And this is Rosalind Franklin that was not awarded with the Nobel Prize, not because she was a woman, but because she died uh, months before the award, uh, even if she was skeptical about the research. But she was one involved in the DNA research. Now. Do you find this image nice? Or can you extrapolate something from this image? Those guys, Watson and Crick, from this image, they speculated that the only way for solving a thermodynamic problem was that the structure producing this image was an helical structure. Simple. So they solved the problem. This is the structure. And they wrote a paper. This is the paper. One page paper, one Nobel Prize. But what is relevant is that the Nobel Prize was for this paper, but more specifically for this sentence. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests 
a possible coping mechanism for the genetic material. Dot. Nobel Prize. Nanoscale. Beauty, I think. Uh, you could see the first picture of the helix, double helix in 1989 only with a microscope. And this is what they do in Singapore using an helix. So it's something that uh, so-called now we could say evergreen. And then you have uh, your DNA that is twisting around the nucleosomes that are twisting again, that are twisting again, twisting again, compacting here and transporting your genetic information because you have a very strict connection among you. And so this is chromatin DNA and the way it works is amazing. So this is DNA inside in a superstructure that you can release in this way, like a rock there. And that is transporting, is governing transcription of information that you have in the DNA, one to the other. A very nice and efficient computer in a very compacted way. And uh, this is the nucleus of the cell. These are ports, nuclear pores. And this is what you could see many years ago. And this is what you could s can see today. You can see the entrance of that port today at the nanoscale, thanks to these guys that got this Nobel Prize last, last year for the development of super resolved fluorescence micro. What does it mean? It means that using light, I can see molecules in the human body, one by one. Uh, you have to build some instruments for doing this, but then you can get information really at this level. This is a Harvard science movie of what's going on in your body when uh, you do everything. When you open the fridge, you try to take the egg and you don't break it. There is something working for you at this level. And there was something that reminds me a relationship with beauty that helped those guys in getting information using the optical microscope. There is this guy, Shimomura, another Nobel Prize, 2008. He discovered that, Medusa, that the jellyfish was able to produce light even if it was in the dark. Isolated the protein, and this guy, Martin Chalfi, with his wife, to Leazerig discovered that you could have expression of this protein, luminescent, s emitting light, in any living organism, including you. I can decide, I can inject in you something that can produce the fact that your noses on the tip have this kind of green proteins. I switch off light and I have green light only from the tip of your nose in case I want to do that. And it's possible doing this. And this guy, Roger Chen, decided that, uh, well, why using only green? Let's use all the color again from the red to the blue. And so these are all the proteins can shine different colors. And so you can see, and I think there is some aesthetic sense here too, what's going on in your brain when you can see in different colors neurons, because colors are not only beauty, colors are related with the functioning of these single cells in your brain, like a rain of neurons connected by colors one to the other. I remind you, 10 power 11 of them in your brain. And then you can have uh, this picture from cells, for example, this is the inner of a cell, nucleus in blue, containing all genetic information. Mitochondria containing the energetic uh, reservoir. And uh, this cytoskeleton is the real architecture of the cell, so you cannot squeeze it. These are cells in tissues, cells again, 
cells from your here, very important. So these are so important that you cannot imagine, probably. Uh, and these are from ligaments of your tendon. When you see harmonic structures, they work well. When you see this kind of structure, there is some rupture. And now we want to use the microscope to see when you apply a drug if these connections become harmonic again and again from your tendon. Ah, this is low quality. Now, if I have 10 minutes, probably if you don't try to kill me, um, now I would like to bring you to this uh, super resolution. So, sorry for now bringing to your attention a technical aspect, but I think it, from my point of view is relevant. When you want to see something in the human body, you try to insert molecules in order to have light and in order to recognize the structure. This is what you could see using the best optical microscope in the world. So nothing strictly related to this one. And this is what you can see using the super resolved microscope. Now this uh, fact, uh, I mean, when you have uh, When you have those objects, maybe my battery is off. No, it's on. So when you have two objects that are too close, you cannot recognize them. I don't want to go into a physics lesson now. Because you are, when you don't have resolution, you are like uh, a traveler in the fog. You cannot see very well. So you see something like this. And now imagine that you are a medical doctor or a biologist. A medical doctor. You want to understand if you have to continue a surgery or not. To remove part of an organ or not, and you have this kind of information. You can say something because you have experience. But it's better if you can get this kind of information with these four molecules responsible for that. It's not a matter of details. Because your feeling, feeling of the medical doctor, is decision related to the image he can see does not change when you go to details. I mean, so if you like this picture, you like this picture if you see this detail or this detail. It's a matter of having a different view of the information contained in an image. Now, I will show you something that you know very well for the place you are, I think. So you recognize this as a Lincoln, and you have a certain feeling. But then your feeling changes when you go through Gala the window. And if you recognize here Marilyn Monroe, and then uh, if you have a different view, your feeling changes. Now, if you, for some of you it could work, if you close a little bit your eyes, this Einstein will be back to be Marilyn Monroe, because this will become smoother, and this also. And this is what the conventional microscope does, smoothing the information. But this is really a different view. So when you are making, when we are making our pointless picture, inserting information point by point from the molecules, we want to be very sharp. We want to be very sharp because uh, your capacity of getting a decision or your feeling with this may image changes if you see the cytoskeleton the building of the cell in this way or if you see it in a different way that is this one your ability of understanding really changes or, or this is what I think so you really like uh, Probably you know, uh, uh, I assume you know Borges, and you read the, the Aleph. And so if you remember the Aleph, when you go into the house and you go down to the 19 stair there, and you make something like this, and I have some back pain in doing this, but it doesn't matter, you can see everything. And the fact that you are not able to see everything 
does not um, make my sentence invalid. This is what is written in the Alep. So today, you have this possibility of having everything in your view, your final view. And this is the reason why you need to change your mind and you need to change the way you're approaching the world when you have nanoscale information. So when Kandinsky was reporting about a possibility of bringing to you what's going on in the world, in the, what he, has, he had around, in certain grids, in certain colors, in certain line and points, and deciding to use these objects for bringing to your attention what's going on. Today we have uh, a different way of bringing information to the medical doctor, to you, to the biologist, bringing to you the molecules, and not only a view that is common for you, but maybe less useful. So this is Marilyn, and this is Einstein today. So now you can count single molecules within cells, and you can decide if a drug is immediately acting well or not. And this again was your Marilyn, and this is your Einstein here. And again, and again. So this is Marilyn, and this is the cytoskeleton with a new microscope. This is what a neuroscientist like Michela Chiappalone, studying her neuronal cells, was able to see before. So these are two neuronal cells connected by synaptic vesicles. And this is what she can get today. She can count the synaptic vesicles one by one. Now, I like to bring to your attention this image or this one, because really we have to change altogether the way we are approaching with data coming by images that we are able to produce or information coming from the nanoscale for any use you might have. I assume that in case we meet outside, here, we can recognize using uh, uh, the fact that we can have some memory of our faces in this modality of view. But what about if outside we can see each other and we can see all the molecules that are in our faces? It's more complicated to recognize one to the other. So I think that there is some training needed to get information from the nanoscale, from this machinery, and bringing this machinery in the human body. Uh, before ending, and I want to show you something here. Sorry for having this, but I know that my, my video does not work. This is a brain, and the idea of Barbara Mazzolai is to have an instrument, an endoscope, that you can inject in the brain, and that using, uh, I don't know if you can follow this pathway here, using the rules of the plants can move inside the brain, bringing the endoscope itself. So merging plants and, in some way, nanotechnology. I have a few slides and a lot of questions that I have for you, and probably also you. I don't know if you know this book. Uh, this book by Berkeley. In this book by Berkeley, there was a sentence related to this fact, that when light impinges your eyes, produces the fact that you are able to bring out from you phantoms that you had already inside. It's something strange because it's called uh, uh, psychooptics or something like that we don't like very much, but can be useful sometime in order to give explanation related of, on, on the reaction you have when you see something. And so now let me have for you uh, just a very short overview of an exhibition we had collecting images from our scientists in order to attract people through the image to the technology. 
So this was, uh, for example, the great wave. This was the title. And this is the picture. This is an experimental mistake, because these layers had to be in a continuous, but there was something wrong, and so it didn't work. Or Alberto Ansaldo, that uh, at the restaurant as a favorite dish, works with carbon nanotubes. And he decided to have this picture of the carbon nanotubes at the nanoscale for attracting people. Uh, Diego used to work to go to mountains, and so he decided to call this microstructure of zinc oxide Edelweiss. And this is my favorite, <laughs> no, one of my favorite. My favorite is the last one. Uh, Sandro Meucci was making an experiment about this nano grid, and there was something wrong. And he had this picture. These are nanogrids. This is a particle of dust. And so this is the final picture you could get. Uh, Francesca is working with crystals, again at the micro scale. Gabriele is working with neurons. Uh, you have seen colorful, colored neurons and this is a picture reminding the Golgi images of many, many years ago. Architecture in your brain grown in a special way. And this is the last one. This is a monk. This is my favorite one. My favorite one because when I see this, I think about a child, a children, a child that did something wrong and whistling is trying to escape, and this is one eye, this is the nose, and this is the head. These are all images, again, at the nanoscale. And uh, I don't know which is your feeling with these kind of images, but could be sort of attraction and some of interest for the technology or nanotechnology behind, in case we were successful. Otherwise, we were simply boring. An example of perfection, you know, again comes from Italy, and is this one, that is science and harmony. Art and physics at the very same time, in the very same description. And so now, I thank you very much for your attention, getting your questions. Thank you, Alberto, for your conference and for the different kind of thinkings and different projects that you've shown. I think there is a lot of food for thinking. Um, I am thinking a lot of how this could be connected with architecture, but let me first get the questions from the people here. Is there any question for Alberto? question basically is it the nanotechnology works beautifully on small scales like they're fu so functional and so beautiful but when we try to connect or relate it to architecture how would it work when we scale up thank you for your question uh, I decided to try to give you the definition of a nanotechnology in the way that is uh, when you're able to control at the nanoscale, at least in one dimension. So you can have a big window, and if you're able to control the surface on the first nanometers between the surface of the window and the environment, you can apply nanotechnology to architecture because you can make this window, for example, as function of the light impinging the window, hydrophobic, super hydrophobic or hydrophilic and so in case you are collecting dust in the day when rain is coming this uh, can can become super hydrophobic super hydrophobic means that water does not squeeze and makes small balls 
capturing dust and washing your window, for example, or walls in your house when you use nanoparticles similar to the ones used, for example, for detecting tumors, can change color as function of the current temperature, as function of the sunlight entering in your room, or as function of an electrical stimulus that you can provide using an electrical device. With graphene, the idea is that imagine that you can build, we were discussing before with RT uh, about this possibility. A house growing with you. So you buy this house with your girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, when you are 20, 25, you start living there. Then you have, in case you have children or you have uh, younger people with you, you want to expand, the house grows. Then uh, you become adult, you have different needs, and then you get old and you have different needs. And you have your house made by graphene technology that is changing the shape according to your current need, for example. This is what I would have in mind in case of designing something new. Um, so really, the fact that we are working at the nanoscale is relevant because everything starts from the nanoscale. Uh, in, in 1990, people using that strange microscope like a record player was able to move in a surface atoms from one position to another position. You could say, come on, boring, you're moving atoms. Well, when I'm moving atoms, I'm able to change property of the material. And so from that starting point, I can embed the sponge that is millimeter you can buy in the supermarket. I can embed with nanoparticles and this sponge tomorrow can become a sponge uh, attracting oil and repulsing water, for example. So thank you for your question, so for letting me clarify this aspect that we work at the nanoscale, but the final destination is the human scale. So as for health or personalized medicine or other aspects. Is there any other material apart from graphene that you are working at the IIT that uh, is able to change uh, shape? Or, or, let me conclude the question, sorry. Uh, or do you work more into the nanoscale in terms of programming the atoms so that properties would change? No, no, uh, thank you for your question. So we work with nanoparticles that we embed in materials like plastics, for example, in order to have them driving possible changes of the shape as function of temperature or light exposition. Mm, these are cadmium, zinc cadmium nanoparticles or titanium oxide nanoparticles. And there is something that is uh, incredibly beautiful. That is, we have nanoparticles that have a shape, an octopod shape, and the octopod shape is a shape that allows you to combine them in different way. And the way you combine them, and after that you embed in a plastic material, what we think at the IIT is that the future is plastic or graphene. So we want to embed the new nanoparticle in plastic in order to have new functionalized materials. Uh, the way you embed them make the new material having different mechanical properties, different reaction to ex external stimuli, and so on. So yes, this changes. It's true that uh, since we, unfortunately, we are scientists, and so we, wo we want to understand more at the nanoscale, and since we are at the nanoscale and we are also human, so lazy, we continue working at the nanoscale. For example, with this kind of changes, of the material, we use them at the nanoscale designing um, 
new mechanical switcher at the nano level. So we have this material with th this titanium oxide that we can embed in the material, then we can shine light. When we shine light, the structure changes. When the structure changes, the plastic follow the nanoparticle change. And so you have this nanoscale object that is changing this and that is actuating like a switcher, a mechanical switcher, uh, peeling something or collecting something at the nanoscale. But you can play this game also at the meter scale doesn't matter when you have the overall um, the, the overall properties applied um, it's true that and so coming back to your question also it's true that sometimes we prefer to work in a very small scale because we are there because it's something that for us is easier to manage for example my dream is to have uh, a super resolution microscope built in graphene and plastic technology of the dimension of a small coin of one cent uh, built on the finger of ICAB or on your finger so imagine that you are a medical doctor you are playing a surgery you have to decide if to cut or not you need a biopsy it takes time but you can plug there your finger and you can get in your, Google, in your Google Glasses all the molecular information to decide if continue or not. So this is something, I don't know if it is a dream that I can see realized or not, but it's nice to, to have this chance to design this kind of, of new experiment, different scales. For sure the building implies a lot of other properties that is uh, uh, monodispersity of the properties so you have uh, you need a lot of nano nanoparticles that act in the very same way in, in, a, in a big space so this sometime is not so so easy to to be realized but it can work Thank you a lot, Alberto. With your luck, I, I, I knew Alberto. It was very generous. Who, he came to the last year in a thing that we done with students. Uh, Talgoa it was a kind of uh, experiment to have a workshop with the students, scientists, or artists, uh, and uh, we were impressed. Uh, here in this institute, uh, we have the conviction that the information uh, and the capacity to record and to manage information is changing the architecture. And I think also that uh, this lecture is very important because, but this is my impression, I am not scientific, I am, uh, that the nanotechnology is linked uh, with this capacity to connect uh, and to transmit information. In fact, at the end, the DNA is... Uh, and, uh, the problem that we have sometimes is the imagination because as you say we need imagination to, to, to imagine things. No? It's true that we can imagine that perhaps it will be pictures with nanotechnology that can react. I don't know. Uh, also pick or uh, uh, the, I am very interested, it was very interesting this uh, new uh, the material that I didn't know, the graphics uh, the, the, uh, with this capacity to how to explain, to change uh, or react or, uh, but uh, I don't know exactly who, how. Is a sensorization? Is uh, it's reacting spontaneous? Is reacting yeah. uh, with uh, information that uh, he, uh, the material is um, receiving. The, and so, sorry, just finish. Uh, and we, I was also very impressed in this uh, demonstration that we did uh, with. Uh, uh, with the, also the capacity that you are very interested to work with this material and also with the recycling materials of uh, vegetation or uh, um, yes, food, etc., to do a new elastic uh, materials, etc. No? And all these materials are uh, not only inert, sometimes they are also, uh, they have the capacity to, to be dynamics, in fact. No? Uh, I am very interested to know more about it, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, about graphene. Graphene has uh, incredible optical and electrical properties. 
So this kind of material can easily change color and can easily uh, implement an electrical network that can be driven by a signal provided by an image. So nothing strange. An image is a collection of dots. Each dot can be related to an electrical signal, and this electrical signal can be propagated in a graphene layer. But just to let you know that today, so this is what we do, we have a graphene ink that we are using for three-dimensional printing or for bidimensional writing that also has, is not only a ink, but is an electrical or an optical ink that can change the properties according to the need that we can print. Or we have snowflakes made by graphene that you can, uh, uh, that you can use for covering surfaces using a spray and that can change the properties of the material where you are spraying them. Now, my dream uh, and what I think it will happen, and this is the related with the factory, is the ability of producing uh, atomic monolayers, so the real crystal graphene, to be embedded in material. Because this has amazing properties, collective properties. But ink, snowflakes, uh, uh, if you go through literature, right, and if you can be so interested to try to Google this uh, name graphene, but take care because you will find a lot of material related to graphene oxide that is completely different material. Or graphite is completely different again, but graphene oxide also. But graphene, crystal graphene, CVD graphene, is really an amazing material. Then about your comment about recycling, uh, sorry for not, I, I simply forgot the slides. I wanted to show you, but what we do is to make uh, bioplastics using garbage from restaurants. So using parcel, using uh, chocolate, using uh, coffee. And we can make mat plastic material, then we can embed this material with nanoparticles so we can have this functionalized in some way. Uh, we can have this transparent or strong. We can have this thick or thin the way we want. Just to give you an example of application, there is a company in Italy uh, the name is uh, Novi, they make chocolate. And they provide us with um, chocolate garbage, that means uh, all this power powder that they cannot use for their selling purposes. We make a thin plastic material, transparent, with the smell of the chocolate. And so they want to use this for packing chocolate, so you customer can see the chocolate inside and you can smell the flavor. It's a, again, is a stupid example from my point of view, but it works. Uh, and, and many other of these, uh, uh, from basil, you can have a uh, plastic material, so you, I don't know what you can do with food delivery, or you can insert some silver nanoparticles and you can have a bacteriological barrier. And so you can think that when you want to deliver food in countries where they don't have storage possibilities, they have uh, this uh, package uh, easy made by garbage and uh, silver nanoparticles, low cost, and with antibacterial properties. So you can really have a lot of uh, things. Uh, but also on the walls, so in, uh, everywhere uh, in your buildings, you can have this. in the research that they done here, yeah, but for example, uh, Areti works uh, a lot with uh, polymers and uh, that have memory, you know, these uh, elastic ma materials. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I so it, uh, it would be fantastic to have all these materials that were recycled of uh, that were bio materials that were not only uh, polymers that you buy, but also ma things that you can uh, that to have these properties of memory of, uh, well, you can explain better, perhaps it's, it's uh, difficult but not today, but it will be possible with this nano uh, research. Yeah, but, but this is the concept behind the what you I call, explain better the this is the concept behind the materials you call smart materials, because smart means that you are able to adapt yourself or the material itself to the changes of the environment, nothing strange, I mean, in the term smart, no? Anything now? We are 
working on, but learning a lot from nature also. Because nature has this great machinery that works very, very well. Now think about plants, really. They work in the dark and they're able to get, uh, to feed themselves and others working in the dark, low energy. This is the reason why we're interested, because our iCab needs a lot of watts for working more than one bar of chocolate that you need for work for the morning to the evening as human body making more complicated things so in fact the next generation of iCab will be a plastic iCab uh, lighter and, and uh, with less uh, energy consumption that is the main the main problem is what you need in terms of energy for having these things working but the, again if you learn from nature you realize that chromatin DNA, when is uh, collecting information from DNA, uses a very poor amount of energy for making a lot of things and for influencing a lot of things. This is what we want to learn, and we can learn together. So, I mean, This is a field new for me. I mean, the, but discussing with RIT was nice because I think that there are a lot of things that in parallel can be done at different scales. So it would be really very nice to try to work together. But I would like to insist on this with young people. There is a book by Richard Bach that was uh, Jonathan Livingston, The Seagull. And there was a sentence, no limits, Jonathan. No limits to your imagination. You can do whatever you want and whatever you have in mind with the current technology, everything. Children are the best in this. So I, I had the design of functional houses from children that are so great, having uh, a lot of, so maybe you remember this. So it's really great. But yes, I think that we can have a, a, a good collaboration on this, because what we need are inputs also for what we do and for having this done in a different way or in a better way. And maybe you can uh, try to exploit uh, our kind of research. I don't think that you have immediately to go to the real building. You can have a simulation in a model with a small amount of material, and then you can decide if it's convenient or not to continue on this. Or you can have this kind of experiment. I, I would like to push on this kind of uh, activity. So uh, let's discuss what we can do tomorrow, starting from this and using our material, our knowledge, and your knowledge in a mixed way. This is the best way for me. Okay. So thank you very much for being here.